Actually, you know what I'd be interested in is someone who's gone a long time ago and hasn't changed. I mean, oh, you had well, a I would, years the first time I went to the year was You can watch it. Somebody else can watch it. Hi. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Good. I'll be happier after this. No. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Would you like to, to have seven offline Oh, hi. Yeah, yeah. hi, thanks. We have, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I had a foray into our solid waste department for six years. Oh. They now recycled me, quote unquote, to our uh, back end transportation. Props ready. Oh, go ahead. Perhaps gesturing in your home away. What to the... I think it's best. Okay. <laughs> this will be short and sweet. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for coming to the uh, transportation seminar. We're very pleased to have a distinguished panel today, and I will turn this over to John Mackler, who is with OTREC, who will introduce the panel, and we'll go from there. All right. Thank you, Rob. Uh, my name is John Mackler. I've recently joined the staff of OTREC uh, as their Education and Technology Transfer Program Manager. Um, I wanted to put together today's uh, seminar so that we could get a few people from our region who attended the Transportation Research Board annual meeting in Washington, D.C. in January uh, to share some of their thoughts with some of you uh, who we assume mainly didn't go to the conference this year and are eager to find out um, what you missed, or uh, maybe you did go and you weren't able to cover all 600 sessions, and so you want to find out what these folks were able to hear in the sessions they attended. Um, one of the things that really triggered my desire is that I kept hearing at the conference that public sector attendance at the conference was down by 20%. Hmm. Uh, somehow the number, of, it's about 10,000 people who attend the annual meeting, was about constant with the year before, but uh, particularly among state DOTs, attendance was down dramatically. So I thought that uh, part of OTREC's service could be to help bring back some of the information that uh, people attended. I could count uh, with some colleagues about several dozen Oregonians who attended the conference. So this is a small sample. Um, so there's quite a few more, but I think we'll be able to share some perspectives. Um, so let me introduce our panel here today. Uh, Gail Achterman uh, at the conference wears her Oregon State University hat, but also has an Oregon Transportation Commission hat. Uh, Matt Burko, a Portland State graduate and now a planner at Alta, and Mike Hoagland, who is with Metro, director of their research center. Um, so they are, I'm going to ask them to give introductions of themselves and describe their TRB experience for a few minutes each in just a moment. But let me just say quickly a little bit of about a TRB 101 in case some of you aren't familiar. The Transportation Research Board is a branch of the National Research uh, Councils and a branch of the National Academies of Science. Uh, they provide a number of services. Today we're going to talk about the annual meeting. They also sponsor a number of conferences throughout the year. Uh, coming up in our region, they have a bus rapid transit conference in Seattle in May. Uh, the, summer, the summer joint meeting, which uh, attracts many of their committees in Seattle in July, 
and a transportation asset management conference in Portland in October. So in addition to the annual meeting every January in Washington, they have several other topical conferences that uh, occur throughout the country. Uh, they also put together um, the National Cooperative Highway Research Program and the Transit Cooperative Research Program and publications like TR News and the Transportation Research Record. So there are a lot of activities that happen around the Transportation Research Board as an organization in addition to the annual meeting that uh, these folks have attended. Um, there's a lot more you can learn about TRB, but that would take the entire seminar. So let me turn it over and start with Gail and then ask you if you could just take a few minutes, tell us who you are, your affiliation, and a little bit about your experience just of going to the conference. Sure. It's a pleasure to be here today. As John mentioned, uh, I have two hats, and it was with both hats that I went to the Transportation Research Board for the first time. Uh, my day job is being director of the Institute for Natural Resources at Oregon State University. It's one of the multi-campus research institutes in the Oregon University system. And so we work with faculty and grad students at OSU, PSU, U of O, uh, and other campuses on natural resource and environmental issues. And one of the major reasons that I went to the TRB this year is because INR's current largest grant is a sharp two capacity grant. One of the things I learned about the Transportation Research Board is it's rich in acronyms. SHARP-2 is the Strategic Highway Research Program, and it is sort of the big overarching strategic research direction for the transportation community nationally, and it's separately authorized and funded by Congress, uh, and it's been it's, this is the second round, so the second six-year transportation authorization bill that has had a strategic highway research program in it. And INR, working with NatureServe, which is a national network that uh, we belong to, uh, proposed on a, a project. I actually was going to bring the poster and put it up, but things got a little hairy walking over here, on developing uh, an ecosystem assessment template that transportation agencies could use to uh, apply when they're developing new capacity. So with this huge funding project, that was one of the major reasons I went back because I had a lot of things to do in conjunction with the SHARP, the Strategic Highway Research Program. Uh, the second reason that I wanted to go was as chair of the Oregon Transportation Commission, which is my volunteer job. I'd heard a lot about the TRB and there are a lot of cutting edge issues that we're grappling with, questions that I was really interested in, that as long as I was going back for my day job, uh, I wanted to uh, explore. Uh, the second thing about the experience of attending, it's, it's really overwhelming. <laughs> and I actually carried this heavy book with me over here. Uh, but as Jonathan said, oh, we all did. <laughs> there, there are over 600 sessions. It's, it's, I've, I'm nearly 60 years old, and I've been to a lot of conferences in my life. I have never been to a conference that's this big. Uh, it's, it's really complicated, just figuring out how you're going to do what you want to do uh, while you're there. Uh, and the other thing that you have to learn as a newbie, and I was a newbie, is what's the difference between all these different kinds of sessions? Uh, and I actually had the experience of, on Sunday, participating in a workshop. These are like two-plus-hour workshop sessions on ecosystem services, which directly relates to the research project I'm working on. Um, also, because we had this big grant, the research board itself wanted to do a poster session on all of the SHARP-2 capacity research. So I did a poster on our projects and participated in a poster session. I'd never been to one of those before either. Uh, and then I'd been invited by um, a, a very a distinguished group to participate in one of the, the featured, which means it's videotaped and broadcast panel on US transportation system scenarios in a world addressing climate change. And Mike Meyer put that together from Georgia Tech. And it was really quite astonishing 
to be on the same panel with Dan Sperling and George Schooner from the I-95 Coalition, and I got to sort of discuss and critique what they said. So they're very different formats, and then on top of all of those formats, you've got the exhibit hall, and you've got the sort of the networking opportunity because you're meeting all these people all the time that you've heard about or read about and now have a chance to encounter. And then in addition, because everybody's all there at the same time, you end up going to lunch and dinner with all kinds of people and and our big research team, there's the actually like three research teams and we're all supposed to fit our stuff together, but no one exactly knew how, so we all had a dinner to have a conversation about that. And then since you're in Washington, D.C., um, there are a, num a number of the attendees, combine, as did I, combine it with lobbying. So sort of on the afternoons at various times when I didn't need to be speaking, uh, the ODOT lobbyist and I were up on the hill um, meeting with the Oregon congressional delegation. So it's very, very busy. Jonathan asked us how to decide, how we decided what to attend, um, and I, I don't... You can I tell us have it was a Ouija board. A, yeah, I mean, I don't have a rational system. I didn't have a rational system, and mostly what I decided to attend was based on what I was curious about uh, in terms of the just kind of cutting-edge issues we're dealing with here in Oregon that I wanted to learn more about and I just highlighted all of those things, and Great. that's what I tried to pick up. Great. Well, that was an excellent primer on the TRB experience. Uh, Matt, do you want to share yours, too? Well, I agree with Gail. <laughs> <laughs> second. All that. Yeah, second all that. Uh, my name is Matt Burko. I'm a planner with Alton Planning and Design, a firm specializing in bicycle, pedestrian, and trails planning here in Portland, uh, also around the country. I'm also a recent grad of the Urban Regional Planning Program here at PSU. So in terms of why I went to uh, TRB this year, I think by nature of being a recent graduate um, and having worked as a graduate research assistant in the Intelligent Transportation Systems Lab, this was, I'm pretty sure, my most prolific TRB that I'll ever have. Um, I had three papers accepted for presentation, a couple for publication. Um, and so I was just going to just touch on uh, what that research was real quickly. Um, Two of the papers were based on work that I did here in the ITS lab under the direction of Dr. Bertini and Dr. Monsier. Um, for two years I was studying the uh, automatic vehicle location data, essentially GPS data collected by TriMet buses. So uh, one paper that we authored uh, was basically we have a year of this data. The buses basically collect data as they traverse their routes. It's a tremendous amount of data. We wrote a paper on using a year's worth of this data, you know, what can you learn about how your transit services uh, is doing? And this was a poster session, and so you know one of the experiences of a poster session as compared to a podium session is that you spend about two hours talking to people one on one, and especially in this transit session, it was it was I mean the hall was packed with people, and I would talk to somebody for five minutes, explain the poster, and as as I was finishing up with them, there was always somebody else waiting in the queue, um, and so you're you definitely lose your voice, um, <laughs> but it was you know one thing it was just it was nice to actually have that interaction with people from all across the country. You know people were were really interested in saying. Oh, well, we, you know, I'm, I work for a transit agency in some other part of the country, and our buses collect this data, but we don't actually use it. And so they're really interested to see how TriMet uses it and what are some of the other uses of it. Uh, another paper was also on the bus data using uh, the idea of using buses as probes. Buses are out all over Portland city streets, uh, experiencing the traffic conditions in Portland, and the idea being that they're collecting data as they're experiencing varying levels of congestion, and can buses be used to help us understand how that the network is performing in real time uh, and, and historically. And finally, more close to my current uh, job, I did a, a bicycle research uh, paper. Uh, I was a intern last year at Metro, and one of my duties there was working on, Metro was trying to incorporate bicycles into their travel demand model, uh, something that's you know pretty much not done anywhere, so we really have very limited ability to know if we invest in bicycle infrastructure, what will we get out of it? You know, How much usage do we think we'll get? Uh, and it's basically a lack of data is the problem. And this was a theme of some of the rest of the sessions that I attended and some of the um, committee meetings I attended. Uh, so I, I took the city of Portland's uh, bicycle count data. They have one of the longest programs, one of the richer data sources. And I just kind of did an, an inquiry into what we could learn from you know, how to explain the variations and the amount of cyclists at different locations in Portland. Um, so fortunately for me, it took a little bit of the guesswork out of this 
you know, trying to deal with that big book of 600 sessions because I was really busy presenting. Uh, so a lot of times I could just uh, relax a little bit with my sessions. Um, but I did, I enjoyed, I went to some podium sessions. The poster sessions are always fun because, as I mentioned, you get to speak with people. And I attended some subcommittee meetings, uh, which are also uh, really interesting to see how they're pushing sort of the agenda of what we're going to research on a given subject in the coming year and hearing, again, experts from all around the country getting together and, and sharing their experiences. And of course, there's the social aspect and, again, another really great opportunity just to, just to get out and see what's happening around the, around the country and, in fact, around the world. So with that, I'll pass along. Well, uh, my name is Mike Hoagland. I'm the research director at Metro, and this was probably my um, eighth or ninth TRB that I've been to, but I hadn't been to one since 2002. Um, we periodically reorganize at Metro, and so I've been off doing solid waste and recycling um, activities for the last six years, and one of the things I definitely missed was um, a forum and a research institute like the Transportation Research Board um, where you can get federal, state, um, local governments, metropolitan planning organizations, universities, uh, think tanks, etc., all in one spot and talk about some of the issues of the day. There's nothing really like it in the solid waste um, industry because it's um, fragmented between private and public sector uh, providers more so than in transportation. And a lot of the private sector people worry mostly about their bottom line, um, labor uh, and employment type issues, and the public sector is typically driven to um, making sure that there's efficient delivery of recycling and solid waste services. So the issues aren't quite as broad. Uh, a couple of things maybe to add to the introductions. Um, again, there was 10,000 people at this conference. So they're spread over three hotels, um, probably all within about a half or a mile of each other. So there is good proximity. It's in a nice location in northwest Washington, D.C. Um, but they do segment the hotels out so that there are similar types of activities going on in one hotel. So although there are shuttles between the hotels, you, um, you don't necessarily always have to be scrambling between the hotels from one session to another. The other thing is the sessions start at 8 in the morning and they end about 9 or 9.30 at night. So there's always something to do. There are committee meetings. Uh, there are committees on everything. Um, and they meet throughout the day. Um, and also on the weekend previous to the to the conference. So there's, again, you have to kind of pick and choose and pace yourself a little bit. Um, I was fortunate this time through not to, um, since I've been out of transportation, I'm not on a committee currently, and I haven't been doing any research um, in the last year or so. So um, I, I was free of giving any presentations or papers or committee work, so I was able to um, pick and choose what I wanted to do. and. What I tried to do was um, given some things we're working on in public policy at Metro. And again, the research center at Metro is a, a relatively new function or a new department of existing functions and some new functions that we're looking at around research. So it took our transportation modeling and forecasting, our GIS data and information pieces, and our economic and land use forecasting pieces and put it into one central location. Uh, so that we can better share information and expertise. And then we're also, if you think about Metro, we do other, uh, we, we have other responsibilities related to parks and public facilities uh, and solid waste, as I mentioned. And so we're starting to develop research and research protocols for those pieces of Metro's activities. So what I tried to do was tie what's going on at TRB to uh, work that we're doing at Metro or work that we see coming down the road. Uh, I think it's no, there's, it's not a surprise to anybody, and, and uh, I want to credit the city of Portland uh, and actually the state now to taking a lead in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and Metro has, while everything we do probably contributes to sustainability and greenhouse gas emissions, um, either directly or indirectly, we've never made that a focus. We're starting to do that now. So, um, And we can also see coming um, down the pipe, so to speak, there will likely be national legislation and state legislation around greenhouse gas emissions. So we're trying to get ahead of the curve. So I was really looking at um, um, sessions or information related to greenhouse gas 
emissions, and I think we're going to get into that into the into the question. So we'll talk more about that. Um, certainly, we're always interested in the um, uh, in funding transportation finance. So anything related to the stimulus package uh, that was under development at the time, or um, the upcoming reauthorization of the federal transportation bill was um, something we were interested in. And then in our we've had some issues uh, or questions around uh, pricing within our models for travel costs and so particularly related to fuel charges. So we were uh, also interested in what's the latest in fuel supply, petroleum supplies, peak oil, issues like that. So the, I was keeping my eye out for that. Um, and then any innovative tools or methods that were coming up such as the bike modeling that uh, we've been working with. Um, PSU on and, and our internships um, as well when when uh, Matt was there. So we were, I was looking for uh, inter, uh, interesting topics there. And then since I've been for a while, um, or I hadn't been for a while, but I'd been there a number of times, you start to also know who the most entertaining, uh, informative speakers are. So you start to look for particular names. Mike Meyer's name, I think, comes up all the time when anybody, you know, you see his name at a session and you try to figure out how to work your schedule to get to those sessions because he's informative, he's provocative, um, and he's uh, uh, usually has uh, has been doing good research. So those are sort of the things that uh, that I focused on. A couple of other things real quick, just to, uh, to again to add on to the, the context of the of the TRB, it's it's multimodal, so it's everything from freight to bike to ped to autos. Um, it's um, it's multi-agency, so there's every branch of the federal government from EPA to USDOT is there, uh, and as I mentioned, universities and local governments are there. And also I wanted to point out that it is uh, comprehensive in its approach. There are sessions on everything, whether it's asphalt, um, skid testing, safety, uh, you know, just the weatherization of paints, solvents used in transportation projects to emerging tools and planning, uh, everything is there and it's a good opportunity to get that sort of, a, of an understanding. So I'd highly recommend it for anybody who hasn't been. A, a couple of other just cl closeouts because you, you both have reminded me of a couple of things. One thing that uh, I found really unusual is that they actually have authors. So the authors of most of the sort of the major interesting books in transportation and transportation policy are featured at authors events sort of late in the afternoon and I didn't get to any of them because they were at the Marriott and everything I was doing was at the Hilton uh, but it's it's a great way to actually have a conversation apparently with some of these uh, top writers like Tom Vanderbilt who just published the book Traffic which is my current favorite book of the moment and I didn't get a chance to get up there the other thing in the exhibits um, that is, you know, I just kind of went through really rapidly, but you, you can pick up all kinds of publications and reports and all kinds of handout stuff that you get at conferences. My favorite, I think I got the best thing, uh, and everyone I've shown it to also thinks it's the best thing. This I got at a poster session, not at the exhibits. But you get stuff like this. This just happens to be the best. This is Switzerland, and it's a simulation of all the traffic in Switzerland in a flip book that you can run one way or the other. It is very cool. Uh, I will not pass it around the room because I'm afraid I won't get it back. But there's a lot of cool stuff like that that if you wander around, you can pick up. And then I think the other thing, and, and Mike's comment reminds me about it, because I've spent my most of my career in natural resources and the environment, not in uh, transportation. The reason the Transportation Research Board exists and the Transportation Research Program exists is that starting back in the 1920s, when the Federal Bureau of Public Roads became involved in transportation, the Bureau of Public Roads, now Federal Highway Administration, and the states all decided that they would take a percentage of their gas tax revenues and dedicate it to research. And so you have this stream of funds and at the time that they started doing this the National Science Foundation didn't exist. Uh, and so the only body that they could think of to run this 
research program was the National Academy of Sciences. And so it's kind of an unusual, it's very unusual for the National Academies of Sciences and the National Research Council, most of which is funded, you know, on a project by project basis with people who are volunteering their time to write reports. Uh, this is a, a funded research program much more like what the National Science Foundation typically runs, except that it is highly uh, public-private academic partnership, which is very unlike the National Science Foundation program. So it's a very unique, rich resource that doesn't exist uh, in the general natural resource or environmental area that I'm more familiar with. Well, that was introductions. <laughs> I'd say we covered a bit. Um, I have two main discussion question topics that I've shared with the panel. I also want to remind the folks who are watching this over the internet that they have the email address psuseminar at yahoo.com that if they want to send any questions so that when we get to a general question and answer uh, towards the end of the session they can get their questions in that way. Um, so the question is, as you know already, uh, that I want you to talk to each other about. The theme of this conference was transportation, energy, and climate change. Um, TRB calls this the spotlight topic. There were probably about uh, 20 sessions on that, as I think Gail alluded to earlier. Um, I would like to hear from you, sort of uh, collaboratively here, what key points did you take away on that issue, whether you attended one session on that or several or just from your lunchtime or dinnertime conversations? Or if there were other topics, Mike, you mentioned a few, that you were specifically going to TRB to learn about. You know, what were some key take-home points that some of the people here might be interested just in, in your key research findings that you heard from people there? Uh, so either on the climate change topic or on maybe something else that you were there to look at. Dive in. Well, I'll, I can start because on the climate change topic, um, I've been spending the last... I don't know, five years of my life doing transportation and climate change and giving speeches on transportation and climate change. And so I didn't go to any of the climate change sessions except for the one that I was speaking at. Uh, at the one that I was speaking at, uh, and I really would encourage all of you to get Dan Sperling's new book, Two Billion Cars, uh, he has, uh, he had some, he had data from California and ways of framing climate change and transportation that took it a couple steps beyond uh, what I've seen to date. Uh, and I'm not going to take time today to try to explain where he took it, but uh, it, I, I think that that was the big aha for me is that I think that, 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 that there's a real rapid evolution of how we're thinking about climate change and transportation, and people are moving beyond thinking that it's all about alternative vehicles or it's all about alternative fuels or it's all about VMT reductions and really looking in a much more nuanced way at what we're going to have to do to get the emissions down. Um, I, I broke the climate change topics into a couple of things that we needed that I was trying to actually better understand and learn um, and then also just kind of getting a feeling for what's the state of the practice, state of the legislation, etc. So. I kind of looked at what are the regulatory approaches that are happening out there, both at the state and federal uh, level. What are the uh, inventory methods? How are people counting emissions? Because we're going to need some level of a baseline. So uh, once targets are established and we develop benchmarks or milestones for getting to those targets, we can track how we're doing. Um, and then what are some of the key uh, implementation issues to get there, particularly in the transportation world? And also when you think about climate change, it's, not, it's obviously just not all about transportation. It's buildings, food production, um, inner city travel. So it's, it's hard to get your arms around it, and I think we're, we're still all struggling. So from a researcher standpoint, the good news is I think there's still a lot of work to do. Um, from a public policy standpoint, uh, it, well, and then maybe the other good news is Relatively speaking, we have some time to do that research if we're looking at targets out to 2050. The bad news is uh, everyone says you need to get started today or you're probably too late. Um, and that, um, that um, there are still some uh, questions out there and people need to get on the same page. And I'll give a, give a couple of those uh, examples. Um, 
either directly or indirectly, you'd sit in a, in a very in, a, in any particular session, and you'd hear about California, the uh, the uh, California Air Resources Board, and the and the requirements that the uh, you know AB Assembly Bill 21 or whatever it was, you know, the California the major legislation in 2003 for greenhouse gas reductions. It's um, I believe it's and this is why it's confusing because I think theirs is 80 percent reduction. In greenhouse gases from a 1990 base level. Um, I other, think that's right. Yeah, and other states are Oregon 70 75 percent from 1990. Other states are using 2000 as their base level. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's an area where we really do need some federal leadership to try to get us all on the same page. Because if you think about it, those reductions are actually tied to a climatic uh, event or changes over time. So it's all about. Um, Earth temperatures, uh, atmospheric temperatures, and things like that. So um, it would be nice to uh, hopefully kind of firm up that science and come up with some targets. On the inventory side, again, uh, there seems to be a growing um, movement towards uh, consumption-based models, which are easier said than done. Uh, basically, the, the current models have been around production, so it's, it's each individual's uh, production more or less as to the number of miles you drive uh, and the models are getting better to better understand congestion and, and speeds on those models and, and your ultimate CO2 emissions. It's the energy you use at your workplace and at your home. It's sort of that tailpipe mentality. That provides a good first cut at it, but then there are the cons uh, uh, so that's a production based model. Then there's a consumption based model which is starts to look at supply chains for goods, input outputs into a region, things like that. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. But I think ultimately that's a better model and it uh, better accounts for um, for what happens in Portland versus what might happen in, in another part of the country versus what's happening internationally. So that's, that's, a, that's an area. And just being able to start to um, uh, differentiate between the, the various frameworks I thought was was interesting. And then on the implementation side, uh, you know, Metro is more of a planning uh, agency. So, um, uh, but it seems like there's a lot of work that needs to be done on the implementation side. Obviously, uh, most of you have heard of things like uh, the need for a smart grid so that you can balance um, energy supplies throughout the day to better uh, utilize the, uh, the energy that we have. Um, you can't move to plug in vehicles until you've got the charging. Uh, facilities all figured out, and so there were some interesting uh, private sector opportunities, money-making opportunities perhaps in that arena, but I think again standardization on how um, recharging of electric vehicles is going to be um, a big thing that we're all going to have to think about. Uh, whether you plug it, you know, right now the limit, there's about a limit to uh, 120 miles, 150 miles per trip on the most advanced electric vehicles, and we're not, the the Technology is not increasing that much, so there is some discussion about you pull into a station, you can pull out the old battery and they'll put in a new battery, but think about the storage and, and, and then the standardization of being able to do that. It would, be, it would be pretty complex real quick. So that was what I, so to summarize what I took out of the greenhouse gas um, discussions is there's still a lot of work to be done, unfortunately, uh, but there's a lot of good work that's happening and I think the structural elements are there to, uh, to move forward. I, I don't know, some of the climate sessions I attended, I was, the, the downside of having so many sessions was that there was quite a bit of, it felt like there was quite a bit of repetition. It sounded like it to it, me, not going to them. Many of the sessions had uh, centered around a piece of research and then had uh, various groups like AASHTO or APTA giving their perspectives. And I thought that one of the interesting things was that it, they, these groups, which are not always in line with each other, seem to be very in line with each other. And they seem to be very accepting of the research findings. And on that one, what I kept hearing about was a report called Moving Cooler, which is expected out in the next few months. There's been a lot of talk about a report called Growing Cooler that came out, I think, about a year ago now. Yeah, yeah. that's the Brookings. That's Steve Winkleman's. And that covered uh, urban form and its effect on climate change. And, I, and there's a report coming out now that's being led by Cambridge Systematics that uh, is called Growing Moving Cooler that's going to address more of the trans so it, I felt the sense I got was everybody's sort of waiting mm -hmm. for this report to come out and then there's going to be this major kind of everybody you know digesting it and then 
Yeah, but the, the problem, and, it, and I think it's partially because it's Washington, D.C., but the, 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 one of the things that struck me was that there, there are really cutting-edge work that's going on that was reflected at the TRB, but then you have the really old-style highway gang, and I guess I've never really been exposed to the old-style highway gang in all of its glory. Um, and there were some things that were said on reauthorization. There were some things that were said on a, a variety of subjects that I found pretty shocking. I mean, it could have been Robert Moses in 1948 in terms of the intellectual perspective of the people making the comments. And, and, on, and then on the other hand, um, you have a lot of the environmental community that thinks that we're going to solve transportation and climate change problems by dressing it through land use. And as Robin Chase, who's going to be here at this seminar next month uh, on March 12th, points out, y you don't turn over urban form in five years or ten years. It takes, we've been running a 35-year experiment in Oregon, and we aren't there yet. Uh, and so the notion of that growing cooler, that the way you're going to reduce VMTs and solve this whole problem is through land use policies, um, I think they're an important component, uh, but they're not a silver bullet. And I really worry that it moving cooler, and this is what I was picking up at the conference, is going to tell us that alternative fuels and new vehicles are a silver bullet. Well, my view is neither one of them is a silver bullet. We need to be doing it all, and I don't. I hope we really avoid the polarization that I'm afraid right. you were picking up. Well, I think that um, one thing from those sessions, and I kept hearing it, either hearing with a straight face or hearing people joke about it, but there was this three-legged stool, which sometimes grew fourth and fifth legs, depending on which session you were in. And the three legs, if I get it right, but again, a little confused after that, was um, a, re a report a few years ago covered the, the vehicles and the fuels. That was the first leg. And the second leg was the growing cooler, the, the land use. And then the third leg was the moving cooler, which is the demand management. And so the, the, the uh, travel options types of programs that we have. So based mm -hmm. on where you live, based on the vehicles that are out there, how do we encourage uh, you know, use of alternatives. So this, this It's focus nice if it turns out to be a three or four or five-legged stool. Yeah, right. The tension is the people right. that are arguing that one leg will do. Right, and I, I, that's why I think it's so interesting that if this re if this report represents the completion of the stool, to extend the metaphor painfully, then maybe you're ready to have the discussion you're talking about. If, if all the legs have been assembled, now you can see whether the stool stands. <laughs> now we can put the metaphor to rest. Yeah, I mean, one thing from from my perspective on the conference on that issue is, well, certainly, I mean, I know it was the theme of this conference, and definitely there was more sessions on climate change this year, and I think this past year there's kind of been a turning point nationally you know, in our uh, kind of acceptance of this issue. And in terms of, like, the different legs of the stool, you know, again, being in the, wearing the bike ped hat, and that's what I was wearing when I was there, is, you know, that community is really looking at this is an opportunity for bicycle and pedestrian projects because we've, you know, historically underinvested in them. And so how can um, how can we be sure that as a part of, you know, this kind of multi-pronged approach that there is more investment going into bicycle and uh, pedestrian projects? And again, we kind of, uh, there was a bicycle research subcommittee meeting and I think similar to the pedestrian subcommittee, this idea of we just don't, we know so little about bicycle and pedestrian travel, again, because of a lack of data. They had all these interesting research questions, you know, but in terms of in this whole conference of all these other aspects of addressing climate change, we know the least about these because they're the least understood most because they're not measured. And so there was really a lot of, a couple of sessions of just focusing on, like, how can we improve the way we measure them so that we can be able to document and say, hey, if we invest in this bicycle project, this pedestrian project, it's going to have a measurable impact on this city or regions, uh, climate change, uh, you know, greenhouse gas emissions or other climate change issues. And so it was really like, from that perspective, it was just like trying to get in on this game because it's, it's, you know. <coughs> to add to that, um, there's, when you kind of think about, so when do we need to be thinking about greenhouse gases with a transportation project? The consensus at this time, and, and obviously it's, it's probably, it seems reasonable, but it's also easier right now, is to um, look at your metropolitan transportation plan or your, at least at a minimum, 
uh, no lower than your your transportation improvement program as your uh, as a group of projects, right. kind of like we do now with air quality conformity right. for carbon dioxide and VOCs, um, as kind of the bundle of packages because any particular project is so small within the dynamic of the full array of greenhouse gas emitters out there that uh, it's it's a it doesn't make a lot of sense even probably at the level of um, the Columbia River crossing. Uh, now, certainly, I think you should look at greenhouse gases in that project, um, but you know, when it's weighed with everything else that's going on in the Portland, Vancouver metropolitan area, it's only going to be kind of a, um, a, a small portion of, of the gases. Um, I was struck that I thought there was, again, this kind of, I don't know if it was the highway gang, and I can't remember the guy that said it. I was just sitting down, it was at the start of a session and the moderator was going on and about how, you know, what are the tools, sort of this five-legged stool to get there. And at the very end he sort of dismissively said, and well, you know, I don't know if we need to worry about land use too much because, I, I, you know, some study that he referenced showed that it was three to four percent. And that was all I heard. Being from Portland, I kind of went, what? You know, and so, um, but as the conference moved on, I heard somebody else, um, and here's a guy named Brian Stone from Georgia Tech. I didn't actually go to this session. Another uh, one of my colleagues from Metro, uh, Peter Boso, went, and he did a, an analysis of a couple of the legs of the stools. What is it going to take to get there, hybridization right. versus land use? And he looked at moderate and aggressive uh, activities, and, and the the, the answer basically is you're going to need both of those yep. at fairly aggressive levels to get to the targets that we're talking about uh, and probably other legs as well. Um, you know, you'd have to have hybridization of the fleet in X number of years, uh, a relatively short time. Well, it takes 17 years for the fleet to totally turn over. So, um, you know, so we've got two opportunities to get there by 2050, but uh, we're going to have to move a little bit faster. And then, as Gail pointed out, the the land use effects, um, you know, the city of Portland and Multnomah County have looked at their greenhouse gases related to land use, and they've basically flattened out, and they've been probably the leaders in land use planning uh, and trying to implement smart growth for the last 30 years. So they've merely just um, leveled out the, the, the growth. Which is good. Which is great. Which is great. Yeah. It's and better than anybody else. To start trending down. So. I mean, I think you, I mean, just one thing in terms of like what people maybe writing off land use or whatnot, you know, what happens outside of Portland, you know, a lot of people, they, well, first of all, I saw it my first day, I saw the same slide about something in Portland four times. There's a lot of looking to Portland in terms of what we're doing here and like, you know, they don't have the, you know, the land use program that right. we have in these other places. So like they're, the way that, you know, the, the whole like kind of framework with which they're kind of thinking about these problems, they don't have a metro. They're, they're really, yeah, I think that's a very good point. It wasn't at TRB, but it was at another very high-level national program that I was invited to. And I, the person called to invite me, and I said, well, do you want me to talk about transportation and climate change, or do you want me to talk about transportation and land use? Well, I want you to talk about transportation, land use, and climate change in 20 minutes. <laughs> well, do you want me to talk about growth management? And the person said, what is growth management? And I thought, oh my God, you know, and this is a guy who works for a think tank that does climate change work. Now, it's, it's scary out there uh, in terms of people's <laughs> level of understanding. The other thing on the climate change, and I guess I'm skipping ahead to, uh, w to you asked us uh, to talk about what were we looking for answers on and what new insights do we have, and it really gets to the moving cooler part of the equation. And, I really think, I mean, the, the most difficult thing we're grappling with in Oregon on transportation policy, in my mind, I mean, the farthest out thing that I know the least about, and our staff has a hard time and our consultants have a hard time telling us much, is what is going to happen and what are the opportunities that new forms of social networking and social networking approaches are going to offer for completely different kinds of flexible ride sharing uh, and transportation choice selection. Uh, and, it, and then, and, and Robin, who's going to be here March 12th, I keep par promoting this March 12th thing, but so I went to a lot of these sessions on social networking, 
on flexible carpools, on car sharing. I uh, had a fascinating conversation at a poster session on, I keep reading about how we don't really need to do the kind of tolling infrastructure that's done back east to do congestion pricing because instead of doing what they do in Stockholm or Singapore with dedicated software, you can use something called an open source mesh network and, you know, I have not a clue. I mean, I, people had attempted to explain to me what an open source mesh network is and why it will revolutionize transportation. And I actually had a chance to talk to a graduate student from UC Berkeley who explained to me what an open source mesh network was and his research project on how it could work in the Bay Area. And it's very, very powerful stuff. And I think some of these opportunities, which are really behavioral changes that could start happening tomorrow, are going to have a bigger effect on climate change in the next five years than anything we do with land use or e electric vehicles. And so that's what I, I really learned a lot about those kinds of things. And, I've, and it prompted me to do a lot of thinking about how do we change behaviors. Well, I want to start steering us into the home stretch um, since our time we're getting into the last quarter of our time here. I wanted to bring up reauthorization because that was another topic that permeated the week. Um, now, Mike pointed out when we were before the seminar that what we knew about economic recovery and stimulus in mid-January is very different <laughs> from what we know today, which was different from yesterday and will be different from tomorrow. But um, tomorrow's is going to be very different <laughs> after two o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> That's your other hat. So. <laughs> I wonder if each of you, relatively quickly, might mention whatever what thought floats to the top when you when you think about what you heard at TRB. There was a lot of talk about reauthorization, transportation reauthorization, climate change legislation, economic recovery legislation. What's <laughs> if we were playing word association? What what pings out about what you heard that week? Well, I, <clears throat> what what comes to mind for me is a level playing field. If I can use two, two, <laughs> two, and more okay. money. I think everybody's hopeful that with this administrative change, and you saw it in the stimulus bill, that there's going to be more dollars available for infrastructure. Now, how we're going to pay for all that, um, I'm not sure, but. Uh, there was consistency. I was at a session where you had the uh, AASHTO, which is American Association of Highway Transportation Officials, sort of the leader of this old gang network, and, um, and Canby from the Service Transportation Program, which is more of a progressive uh, think um, uh, advocacy group in Washington, D.C. They've been around now for about 15 years, which push alternative modes, land use, uh, coordinated transportation, smart growth, blah, blah, blah. Um, they both spoke at the same time. Um, session and they their comments mirrored each other. Mm -hmm. and I, it was it was nice to see the Ashto folks um, promote things like, well, I think there's going to have to be in the bill or somewhere a companion bill, 35 miles to the gallon, um, yeah, uh, cafe standards by 2020. So there's really no arguments over those types of things anymore, at least amongst these two groups that used to argue. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Horsley also said, well, and we'd like to see 80% growth in the highway program, which might not be all bad if it's going for, you know, good projects and preservation and maintenance of our existing infrastructure. But he also said, and we need 80% increase in the transit program. And there's actually a lot of money in the transit program, so 80% increase in the transit program would be a real, uh, would be um, a good thing. And the reason I think he said it, I didn't talk to him afterwards, was that he now realizes that it's just level the playing field or equity, if you will, amongst the, the modes, is that um, he can't just stand there and say nobody's riding transit anymore, nobody's, um, everything has to go to highways, blah, blah, blah. He, he really was understanding that for him to be able to get highway, sh highway share, he's got to give up on fighting the transit share. So I think that's a major sea change for those guys. I, I also was struck on the big reauthorization panel that I went to. I was, I, I dug out my notes. Virtually every speaker from the Atlanta M MPO, the Michigan DOT, the the Ashto representative, the Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana <coughs> uh, MPO, they all said that reauthorization was going to have to address climate change, was going to have to address mm -hmm. project delivery, transit funding, it was going to have to come to grips with earmarks or really the elimination of the very heavy reliance on earmarks in the last bill, 
it was going to have to shift the funding mechanism to a VMT-based funding model. Uh, there were going to have to be new performance measures. The issue of MPOs and the consolidation of MPOs was a big issue. Um, you know, Albany could become an MPO after the 2010 census. We've got an MPO in Corvallis. Do we really want an, a Corvallis and an Albany MPO when the communities are 10 miles apart? And, and there are some states like North Carolina has something like 73 MPOs. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's going to be an issue. And then the other thing that came up in the conversation is there was this real convert, it was a discussion going on about whether the reauthorization was going to be evolutionary or revolutionary. And there are people who make both arguments. So I was struck also, like Mike was, by the common ground on some really major components that surprised me. And maybe as a word of encouragement towards it being revolutionary, I went to a, a session one evening. It was uh, TR, TRB gave an award to the city in the world that was was that did the most in the past year towards advancing sustainable transportation, um, and one of the keynote speakers of that was Congressman Earl Blumenauer, and so it was kind of you know it was cool to see to see Earl there in D.C. in his environment, knowing that he is uh, rising in prominence in this field and with reauthorization, um, and actually, I think historically that award has been given to you know cities around the world, and this year it was actually given to New York City and kind of learning about what, what they're doing. And, you know, a city who, um, you know, when you talk about, I remember in classes where New York was always the outlier because they had such an, you know, incredible density, population density, you know, and, you know, the transit usage and the pedestrian trips, and that they're, like, really pushing the envelope and, and taking it further, um, I thought it was really encouraging. So. Um, we'll open up in just a second. So if you've been percolating on some questions, be ready to ask them. Um, I had a couple of wind-down questions here, but the one I'd just like to focus on before we open it up is, um, are, you, are there organizations that you want, you know, that you heard speak? You, you mentioned some, you know, you mentioned Mike Meyer that you really like. Did you, you know, was there a note that you said, I really want to stay on top of this open source mesh networks guy from Berkeley or another, you know, what, what do you want to, what did you really want to follow up on after going to TRB? I, I had two. I, I really want to, I knew this before, and Dan Sperling has actually been here and talked to this seminar, uh, but Dan Sperling and his shop at UC Davis is doing a lot of very interesting work in the climate change area, and they've got much better data because of California's investments in the past. But also, I've gotten to know through the Meeting of Minds conference last summer here, and then followed up at TRB, Suzelinski at the University of Michigan's uh, Transportation Center uh, is doing very interesting work on hubs. And it's this network theory and the hub nodes analysis that she's doing. And we're actually going to try, and we'll, Rob will probably hear more about this, but she's going to probably be out here in October. Uh, and we hope to have her at the seminar then, because I think that that the work they're doing on intermodal connections and hub clusters is really powerful in terms of making transportation choices real. Okay. Uh, for me, again, in my limited uh, non-presentation time at TRB, I did wear my bike pad hat, and one of my favorite sessions was by an organization called Complete Streets. Yes, yeah, they great. And yeah, I mean, that was where I first learned about New York City and what the things they were doing, and um, you know, just the concept of of a street accommodating all modes. And while it's maybe not appropriate for every single street, seeing the examples of where it's been successfully implemented um, is really interesting and the stuff in organization that I would like to, to stay up on. You know, I, I also was impressed by New York City. I saw a couple of presentations, and so I had that on my list as well. Um, you know, the, I know you guys are doing some work around the, what is it, the bicycle tracks or the. Mm -hmm. Um, but they've they've got a lot of those implemented there, and I think it's something we can we can look at. Um, believe it or not, I thought one of the interesting areas of research, and it might have been because of the the presenter, um, was Exxon Mobil has done a lot of work. Uh, they need to around uh, energy and peak oil, and uh, the guy who gave the presentation I thought did a pretty good job of of their perspective on where they think the energy world will be in 2030. Um, and it was, but it was different than what I heard. 
afterwards at a, a, a solar from a solar panel um, in San Jose that I listened to about you know how much energy will be from oil uh, and actually oil is only a small piece when you when you look at coal and mm -hmm. um, uh, all the other uh, energy sources uh, including solar and so there's a lot of disagreement in the energy field yet as to what the world will look like in 2030 and 2040 so I'm, I'm getting my little list of people and their websites that I can track their inventories and forecasts and, and ExxonMobil has a really n a nice user-friendly um, easy to read uh, website I just want to mention the one that I rushed home to look up in Dallas the MPO used some of its funds to work with a uh, car insurance company to do a um, pay-as-you-go pay insurance mm, yeah. as they did sort of like the Oregon VMT where we you know put some money in people's pockets they did the MPO used its money to, to people's actual insurance policy to see how that would work so I ran home and wanted to look that Can up. I say one more thing? <clears throat> no. I'm yes. going to. <laughs> the airlines cannot be trusted. <laughs> the, uh, Thanks I for coming. <laughs> you know, if you want to hear something that was bad, the most lame excuse for fuel surcharges and baggage fees was from the Airlines Association industry at one session. This is after the prices have fallen. He was trying to show graphs as to why they need to keep all their surcharges, and it made no sense, and everybody was looking at each other, and we all walked out of there shaking our head. So. I the just other, just on that. a closing note on the New York experience, one of the other most stimulating panels that I have the most notes on is on uh, on parking pricing and demand management. Uh, and this is something that municipalities, and, and it's all in the Portland City Council's agenda right now, New York has done the most interesting work on parking as a demand management driver. It's quite fascinating. Great. Um, I think this is where we, we have a few minutes left to open up to some questions, and Rob's got his hand up first. I was just going to also comment that the all of the 1,500 papers, you leave TRB with a DVD that contains 1,500 papers that you can then go home and read. And what we do in our lab is we put them on our central server. They're searchable, so students can go back, I think, as long as I've been going to TRB, back to 1990-something about uh, looking at all those papers. We did have a question online uh, from one of our online um, observers, and uh, w the question was, w what could be improved about TRB to make it more effective? Uh, just to make sure that, make, in case that mic wasn't working, you know, the, the, the question is, what could be improved about TRB to make it more effective? <laughs> I have a comment. Uh, one of my sort of, if you go to a, like a podium session, the way they like to do it is to have, you know, maybe four presenters on a common subject, but their presentations, are, you know, obviously are not always all that similar to each other. And I would rather, if they could figure out a way, maybe if there wasn't 600 presentations, you know, if it was sort of like condensed a little bit, um, because often you go in there and there's one that you wanted to see and it's really good, and the next one's, you know, not as good. And I, I think they could maybe, it's, get, it's gotten so big, and I think that they've got the quantity. I think they could maybe do something to get the quality up a little bit higher. Well, one of the technologies that they tested this year that benefits us for our topic, um, for the spotlight topics, uh, they, as Gail mentioned, they called them e-sessions. So something that you can do if you go to TRB's website is you can now go and the, I think, 20 or so uh, spotlight topics, you don't get to see a video, not like this where you see a video of the speakers, but you can get the audio synchronized with their PowerPoint presentation. So you get a pretty good sense of uh, what their presentation was. And I think that my understanding is from the TRB staff that they're planning on expanding some of those technologies to, to share what happens there more broadly. I guess I, 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 uh, I found it distracting and I can't imagine what it would be like if you were actually really actively involved in the TRB committees because there are certain people that are trying to do their committee work and, they're at, and the committee meetings are all simultaneous with all the sessions and so it's like some of your most active people and most knowledgeable people aren't at the sessions because they're in these committee meetings and it seemed quite bizarre to me. Um, I, I just wonder whether or not they wouldn't be better off having the committee meetings a day ahead and a day after and then not trying to run the session for as many days as they run the days. But 
heavens, they've been doing it all these years. What is it? The 80th. 80th, 88th year. So as a newbie, I <laughs> well, it's a, lot a little of the, presumptuous to make Gail, suggestions. Gail, a lot of the committees do meet on Sunday. I think you're right, though, about the day after. the. <clears throat> by the time Thursday morning rolls around, they have a half day of sessions. And, um, you know, the, this year in particular, there wasn't that many sessions that I thought were worthwhile and they probably could have moved more committee meetings to that Thursday morning. Mm -hmm. I think we had a hand up. Yeah. Yeah, Bob Fraser with experience. Can you, Bob, can you, um, yeah. Oh, you have to yeah, hold it. Hold it. Yeah. yeah, Bob Fraser with experience. I handled, uh, our company handled the uh, low for the meeting. I hope it went uh, extremely well. My question is um, finding solutions through research and then selling it to the public and, and to the legislature. I noticed recently that um, the subject of taxing drivers through mileage came up, and that, I believe that was a study through, through the Portland State University, University maybe in conjunction, conjunction with Metro. And, and it was immediately shot down by the White House. And uh, I, I'm just wondering, was that topic uh, addressed at the at TRB in terms of selling the results of all it, of this research? It was. Repeat the, and repeat the question. The, the question was, uh, what happens when you have this great research done, and then how does it actually get sold to policymakers and legislators? And the example was uh, finance based on vehicle miles traveled, and the fact that I think you're referring to uh, Roy LaHood, the new Secretary of Transportation, saying he thought we needed to move to a mileage-based tax, and the White House Press Secretary immediately, uh, it was like whack-a-mole, whacked him down, and then a Representative Oberstar, who is the key player on surface transportation, uh, whacked down the Press Secretary, so uh, saying Press Secretaries in the White House don't make transportation policy, we do. Um, at the TRB, Jim Witte, who uh, actually the research you're referring to, Oregon is at the cutting edge internationally on the experiments related to odometer or mileage-based taxes, and TRB funded Jim Witte, to, uh, who runs that program for ODOT. The technology was actually developed by engineers at OSU. The pilot program was run by, I'm not sure who all the faculty were running the pilot program with ODOT, but Jim was commissioned by, o, by TRB to do a special report on VMT-based uh, finance, uh, and that was presented to the, the, to the meeting of the full Transportation Research Board uh, at the session. And so it did get real attention there, and there were a lot of sessions that were related to it because of the imperative for a new finance model. And so I do think that the kind of research that TRB actually reached out to our state uh, provided us some resources to be able to write a report that took the lessons we've learned and generalized them. Uh, it was very, very well received by the leadership, which is both represents academics as well as policymakers. Uh, and the National Surface Transportation Commission that's been working on transportation finance just issued their report yesterday and said the solution to our problems is a VMT-based tax, a uh, VMT-based finance system. So that report just was released yesterday. So it's it's all building and it's all research-based. I'm going to defer to Rob or do we need to wrap up? Okay. Um, so I'd like, before Rob makes a few announcements, I'd like to thank uh, Gail and Matt and Mike, our panel, um, and all of you for coming. Thank you very much for your contributions. Thank you. And just a reminder that next week, uh, David Kraut from TriMet, who's right here with us, will be speaking on ITS at TriMet, the fourth leg of the stool, system, uh, system operations, improving service and saving money. So we hope you'll all join us next week. One other announcement, uh, another event that's coming up that we're involved with uh, sponsoring, the Transportation Research Forum 50th uh, Annual Forum will be held in Portland March 16th through 18th. Several of us are presenting. Um, Dan McFadden is the lunch keynote speaker. It's being held at the Doubletree in Lloyd Center. Highly recommend uh, certainly the lunch on Monday, March 16th. should be a great event. So thank you again, everyone. Great. Thanks, Rob. Have a great day. Thank you. Good luck, Gail. It's, it's between now and March 9th.
testy. We'll make it through this afternoon, and then we'll see what happens Great. next. Well, thank you very much. Bye. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, that's yeah. good. We need more time. Hi. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. 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 On any aspect.